Today. First of all, we've got some guests here. We have on my right uh, Tim Deer Jones. He's an environmental pollution consultant and is the author of the petition which went through or is currently going through the, the assembly regarding the, the mud from Hickey Point. On my left here, we have Dr. Chris Busby, Director of Green Audits and Scientific Secretary of the European Committee on Radiation Risk, and is also a former visiting professor of the University of. Ulster. Um, further down we have Richard Bramhall, Bramhall, Secretary of Low Level Radiation Campaign and former member of the Westminster Government's Committee examining radiation risks of internal emitters. We call Kerry for short? Yes. Okay, same name as my wife. Um, first thing I suppose just uh, for uh, notice <coughs> is the, the, the complaints issue with me and implied. Uh, the only thing I've got to say in public really is that I've referred it to, to lawyers and my lawyers are in touch with the party and that will take its own course really, so I'd like to leave that to one side. Just a quick mention as well. Can I just ask you one question on that? Yeah. Do you know, for certain, whether the Standards Commissioner, have you, has, have you been notified whether he is investigating or whether those complaints are now going back to the party? Um, I've not been notified yet, no. You haven't? Have your lawyers? Mm, not from the commissioner to check that. No, no. 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 So you're still otherwise. Um yeah, uh, just a plea brief if maybe Media Wales who have a copy of the complaints, if they can let me know what they are, then I'd be I'd be delighted. So no, it's with the lawyers, I'll let them deal with it. And uh, you know, we'll uh, see where we end up with it. There's nothing we have to say about it, to be honest. Because there was this issue about the time lag. Yeah. Yeah. Which could could mean that the uh, yeah, yeah, standards I, commissioner could couldn't investigate. I, yeah, there's the issue of, of a 12 months rule because the complaints are over 12 months old. We did write to the commissioner and ask him to, to waive that rule and investigate because I think having published the some of the complaints, they're pretty spurious to say the least. Um, did you so, reply to your letter? Mm, no, we, we, we're still waiting confirmation or not as to whether he will proceed. I wouldn't imagine he could really, but uh, it's, it's still with, with them. Um, the s second thing is, um, I was contacted, this, this is for, for the Welsh media really, I was contacted on Twitter by Chicago Tafia, and they would expressed a lot of frustration with the uh, BBC and media in Wales, that they just can't get any coverage for what they're doing in, in North America. And for St David's Day, there are now going to be five buildings lit up in Chicago uh, to celebrate St. David's Day. Uh, in Illinois, there's going to be a building lit up as well. And St. David's Day is now officially recognised there. And I think it's a, it's a nice, maybe, media story for you guys to get in touch with them and liaise about how St. David's Day and Welshness is being promoted in, in the United States. Okay, the... the, the the, you know, if, um, if anybody would care to go to Chicago, I, I would declare myself uh, available to, to accompany you. Uh, anyway, thirdly, this, this is the, the substantive business for today, really, which is uh, the, the mud at, at Hinkley, Hinkley Point. Uh, the, the gentleman on, on the table have, have very kindly uh, agreed to, to come down. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, I, I'd like to start, start the comments off really with some questions of my own because as uh, a politician, <coughs> as a non-scientist, what I have are questions and my questions have still not been answered and I think the first thing that I'm accused of is scaremongering, that this mud is the same as the mud that you find in your garden and therefore there's nothing to worry about. Uh, it's been mentioned that it's the same radioactivity as found in bananas and we're told that the material is not radioactive. Now, all I've been asking since September are questions and I've still not had adequate answers uh, as, as far as I'm concerned. So really, I, I throw it open to the uh, guys on the panel. I just wonder what you, 
what you made of those remarks, really. Yeah, I'm, I'm very supportive of your remarks, Neil, because um, I started the petition on the basis of the fact that the proposal was there and there was no background data. Can you all hear me clearly now? Yeah. And there was no background information. Um, it's common standard when um, develop, developing a proposal to do environmental research. And uh, in the case of the proposed deposition of what from um, NRW and CFAS and Welsh Government figures amounts to somewhere around 9 billion becquerels of radioactivity, which is a large sum on mass. That's the aggregated radioactivity in the proposed sediments to be disposed of. If you're going to chuck that much into the environment, it behoves everybody under their duty of care to their populaces to do background research. And what we very simply asked at the very beginning of this process in September in the petition text was, could we please have some information about where will the radioactivity and the radioactive material end up in the coastal environment of South Wales after being dumped? We've not had any answers to that. Neil himself pushed NRW at one of the more recent meetings three times to answer that question and did not get an answer. So that data remains unknown. Second thing is we've asked, if you're going to put radioactivity into the coastal environment of South Wales, please can we have an assessment of the current doses of radioactivity being received by coastal populations from pre-existing discharges from Hinkley, from weapons test fallout, which is still falling on us, from Chernobyl fallout, which is still in our environment, and so on and so on. We don't know what that is. Nobody's done any comprehensive work across the South Wales coastlines to investigate that. So therefore, if we're going to put new radioactivity into the environment with no idea of what the existing doses are, any dose that NRW or the nuclear industry come up with is a dose from what they're doing, but we haven't got the composite dose, including the material from um, what the levels are of radioactivity are before the dump. And then the third thing is, uh, we have no, no idea, actually, of how much radioactivity there is in the South Wales coastal environment. So these are very simple questions, and to ask such very simple questions in the context of possibly 9 billion becquerels of radioactivity, possibly more, because, as we'll hear later on, we don't have the full data on the radioactivity anyway because the surveys that have been done uh, on behalf of Welsh Government have been inadequate and incomplete, only appear to have searched for three of the 50-plus radionuclides discharged down the sea pipeline of Hinkley into those sediments. So just looking for three isn't going to give us an idea of what the total radioactivity there is going to be. So I'm deeply dissatisfied, very pleased with the process that we've had of the National Assembly and the Petitions Committee, deeply dissatisfied with the response of Welsh Government, NRW and EDF, and to call us irresponsible and alarmist when they're proposing to take this test, this, this, this step, without acquiring the necessary background data, I think that's irresponsibility and just pushing the blame onto other people by using naughty words to try and frighten the children. Thanks, Tim. Got any comments to make? Well, I'll come in on the, I mean, I, I, I agree what Tim has said is that we don't have sufficient data. <coughs> and so we, we want more information, particularly information with depth. But, but my, my, my comment would be about the health effects. We already know that, that the releases from Hinkley Point, and these include particles of radioactive material, uh, enriched uranium. And I have a table here from the United Nations Scientific Committee uh, which lists the particle releases from Hinkley Point. So there's no argument that these, these nuclear sites release radioactive particles, and you will have been given a handout that shows um, details of particles in the mud, in this case from Southfield, me measured by, by my laboratory. And you can see in the top left-hand corner here, uh, these are mud cores, and what you can see is that the particles, and they, they show themselves as bright splodges here because they're irradiating photographic film, they go down quite a way, they go down quite a depth. So taking samples right from the surface doesn't tell us what's in, in, these, in this mud material. This is 330,000 tons that are going to turn up to a venue close to you, a few miles away here on the coast. 
and then that will be brought to walk ashore by wave action and by what's called sea to land transfer. These are all well known mechanisms, and so people in this area will inhale these particles and then they'll end up inside them, like the picture that you have here in the bottom right hand corner here of, of these radioactive particles in, a, in an edible mussel. Um, and so, what I'm saying is that bananas don't contain radioactive particles like this, and your garden certainly doesn't contain radioactive particles like this. So these particles are capable of producing a lot of damage to local cells. Now, if you take a, if you take the normal natural background radiation dose, the external radiation and the internal radiation and so on, this provides you with one hit per cell per year. There are, there are a lot of cells in your body, and uh, <coughs> a, a number of scientific studies that have shown that the, uh, that the, the actual impact of a radioactive particle on your cells will be one every year, and that's usually um, repairable. But that's not the case if you end up with one of these particles inside you. You'll get lots and lots of hits in a very short space of time. In fact, this picture here is one of the photographs that I took a few weeks ago, and you can see that there are 40, 40 hits there that have occurred in a very very small air, uh, volume of material in a very short space of time. That was, a de that was developed over a day or two. So the health effects are significant. We found health effects down in the Pinkley Point and I've written a scientific paper. It's been published in a peer review literature showing that these substances do cause cancer and they will cause cancer. It's permitted to help to dump them over here off the coast of Florida. Which you've got anything to, to add to that? <coughs> Uh, only to, to, to <coughs> emphasise a couple of points that Dr. Busby has just made. The, the, the hits from the bananas, since uh, if they want to talk about bananas, maybe we should talk about bananas. The, Dr. Busby has talked about the natural background giving you one hit per cell per year, which is normally usually repairable. We, the body has repair mechanisms which which sort out damage of that nature pretty successfully. Now, the, the dose from the bananas is part of that natural background. You don't actually get any additional a dose from eating a banana because your body is largely composed of potassium-40, which is slightly radioactive. Life on Earth has, it, has evolved in an, an environment which contained potassium-40. The second so it's one hit per year, including the potassium-40, easily repairable. The point about the num we can say something about the numbers in this yellow image on the screen, which is on the page, which is a, a photograph taken looking down the microscope, and I think 200 times in the magnification. What you see there is, as Dr. Busby said, about 40 hits. It was actually 40 hits in 20 hours that the, this sample was exposed to the, to the plastic uh, for 20 hours. So that's 40 hits in two hours. And actually, you're, what you're seeing there is only one-sixth of the decays from that radioactive particle. So that would be 300 hits in the 40 hours. So that would be, if that were lodged in your lymph nodes, or in your lung, that is steadily irradiating your, the, tip, the cells in the immediate vicinity of that particle. And we know that cancer starts with damage to a single cell. We know that genetic malformations start with damage to a single germ cell. Th this rate of irradiation is going on, hitting small, but very small volumes of cells on and on and on, indefinitely, every day, for as long as you live. Do we have any, any questions? Why is it, do you think, that despite the points that you've made, uh, which appear to suggest <coughs> that there is genuine cause for concern about health impacts, that public bodies like the Welsh Government and NRW are resistant to the kind of arguments that you're putting forward? What, what, what's, what's this all about? Can, can I just, just to repeat the question? I was, Mark Shipton from uh, Media Wales, because the, the viewers sometimes can't hear the questions. So the number that really was, you know, why is there resistance from the Welsh Government and Natural Resources Wales to address the, the concerns that are being raised here? Well, there are two reasons. The, fir the first is the obvious reason that you'd expect us to say, which is that there's an enormous amount of money riding on this. There's, uh, there's political developments relating to nuclear energy. 
huge amounts of money involved there. There's also the military aspect because these nuclear power stations are also used to produce tritium and, and plutonium for, for weapons. And so the military are, are quite involved in all of this. And also the use of depleted uranium weapons it also pivots on this idea of how dangerous these, level, these amounts of radioactivity are. So that's the, the first is the, ob that's the obvious answer. Uh, but but the, other, the other point about this is that this evidence has really only emerged very strongly in the last five to ten years. And, it's very, and, and the inertia associated with, with, with large organizations that are responsible for um, regulating the, the exposures is, is, is immense. It's absolutely immense. And the inertia of the scientific, if you like, the, the scientific community is also immense because people who've lived with the, the idea that this stuff is okay uh, or, or not okay, but not terribly unsafe. Um, these these people have become professors, and so there's a sort of iner inertia associated with the, with the scientific. But this, but this is changing because I, I gave I gave a talk to well not a talk I was I gave evidence to the Swedish uh, Environmental Court uh, in September of last year, uh, and the and the, and they were advising the Swedish government about whether or not they could go ahead with the construction of a, of a nuclear, high-level nuclear waste facility at Forsmark in the north of <coughs> Sweden. And, and millions and millions of pounds have been spent on this development. And, the, uh, and following uh, my, my evidence to the environmental court in Stockholm, these are eight judges, they, they, they concluded in January, just recently, three weeks ago, that they were not going to permit this to go ahead. And so this, this development, which is, which is like a gemstone development for the nuclear industry, it's like how we're going to get rid of the nuclear waste, was, 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 was kicked out by the environmental court. So, and if you go into court, and I've done a lot of court cases in America on, on these issues of the, the dangers of internal radionuclides like these particles, we always win the case. What happens is the case is settled because you know, the evidence that this is a problem that doesn't want to get out into the media. So we. We would say, I mean, I would say that those are the two reasons. First of all, there's the, if you like, the, the, the Kuhnian sort of scientific paradigm change inertia associated with any revolution in science. But in this case, the revolution is associated with huge amounts of money and influence and power associated with, with the development of nuclear and, and all the military, <coughs> military aspects of this. Can I? Uh, can I add to that, please? Um, the other thing is that you have this orthodoxy that, that uh, um, um, uh, Chris has referred to uh, within the establishment, but also then that orthodoxy, where do you get your teachers of nuclear science from at the university? From the industry and from people who have professional qualifications. So there's a cycle there. So everybody new is taught what everybody old knew. And if you come along with new information, then that is very difficult to shift into that and get that heavy, heavyweight, long-established orthodoxy to change its view. And then the, the second thing is that, of course, when governments allow themselves to be persuaded to engage in nuclear projects, then you need regulators and you need advisors. Where the hell are you going to get them from except from the nuclear industry? So then you have people like we three visiting <coughs> this panel who proffer an alternative view about what is happening in terms of health effects or, uh, or in my case, the, the marine behaviour of radioactivity. And the orthodoxy finds it extremely difficult to accept. The government advisors who were all taught in that orthodoxy say to the government, no, no, these fellows, they're all lunatics. They're not following the orthodoxy. They don't know what they're talking about. But of course, as we follow science through, you can look and see that science does indeed evolve, and it has to engage with new ideas, and it has to change its basic positions about what is what and what is not what. Now, originally, when discharges to sea were first commissioned in the 1950s, there was a mad rush to produce a weapons program, get on with it, start producing plutonium and refining plutonium out of Stellafield, etc. Nobody 
because we're in the 1950s and we're still hanging over from the end of the war, they had been extremely restricted and cut back oceanographic research on the way oceans behave and the way pollutants behave in the marine environment. There had been no fieldwork research prior to 1952 about the way marine radioactivity behaved in the sea. Nonetheless, they said, right, OK, we'll come up with a hypothesis. The hypothesis is everything that's dissolvable will dissolve to infinity in the vastness of the sea and everything that isn't dissolvable will attach to sediments and fall to the seabed attached to sediments off the end of the pipelines. Well, any fool can look at the official monitoring now, which is being reported for the Bristol Channel, and you can see that hinkley derived radioactivity is all over the Bristol Channel. It's in the sediments, it's in the fish, it's in the seafoods, like the seaweeds, um, and uh, certainly studies elsewhere. We haven't had any on the South Wales coast, but we've had three studies of sea to land transfer along the Welsh coast, all of which have demonstrated that marine radioactivity Activity from man-made sources is transferring from the sea to the land, landing on food crops grown in the coastal zone. People are eating those food crops and therefore acquiring a dose that way. It's logical to assume that if that is happening, then radioactivity from the sea is airborne. Coastal populations will be breathing it in. These are issues that we have raised through the Senate Petitions Committee on this particular campaign here. We're still waiting for answers and comments and input. We don't want to be told, it's, it's no good to the public to be told that we are irresponsible and alarmist when we're asking very simple, very basic and very righteous questions. Um, really, I've got a question for the media more than anything else because um, no, I'm, I'm not saying that the, these guys are absolutely correct, but clearly they're, they're, they're raising issues. And the problem that I've got is to, to have been unable, unable to have got answers from September, September last year, and for the whole of the mud, the whole of the area where the mud is going to be dredged up to three metres down, there have been only five samples, five beneath five centimetres for 2000, uh, back in 2009. And the data, the raw data from those samples, no longer exists. So all I'm saying, and I think all the public is asking really is, why not test them out? You've heard the point of view from the gentleman here today, and Natural Resources Wales say something different, the Minister says something different, okay, fine. I'm not saying who's right, I'm not saying who's wrong. Test the mud. That's reasonable. And we're in a situation now where they're unwilling, unwilling to test the mud. I, I don't understand why. Where is the mud currently? It's still in the seabed at, uh, off, off Hinkley at the moment because um, they can't store it. They've been told not to store it on land. Um, nobody wants it on land, so, and nobody seems to want it on the English side. Um, it seems it's got to come over here and be chucked into, into Welsh coastal water, so it's still in the sediments at the moment. Um, What's the alternative? Hmm? What's the alternative means uh, for disposal? Well, that's a very interesting question, isn't it? Um, are there different ways of actually dredging? Because, I mean, really, what, what we're doing, what, what they're doing is taking the sediments out in order to put pipelines and water intakes in. Now, there may be different ways of dealing with that. There may be appropriate times of day uh, or year in which to do the dredging, um, because summer is the time when most of the um, coastal accretion, the build-up of sediments on the coast takes place. So anything that you put into the sea during the summer is far more likely to end up um, adding itself to a beach rather than being eroded and taken out to sea. So that might be a mitigating factor, different time of year, um, different techniques. Uh, maybe look for a, 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 a more suitable disposal site, perhaps an on-land enclosed site where you can monitor and control the material. Um, it's not really my problem. Um, those who are proposing the proposal need to find safe options and plainly if they do anything other than what they're proposing to do it's going to cost them a lot more money. It's really cheap, relatively speaking, to dredge it up, put it in a dredger, take it over to the Welsh side and chuck it into the water. <coughs> You're done. It's finished. It's over. It's gone. Can I just touch on cost as well? Because we're talking a multi-billion pound development. Mm. And to, to test this material thoroughly, you look at less than £100,000. Yeah. A, a, ridiculously, a ridiculously small sum in comparison to, to the overall project. So 
you know, I, I think it's incumbent on everybody to, to be asking, why not test the material? Could, could, could I ask, you, got a few, um, few months on this. Um, you provided us with um, photographic evidence here of um, radioactivity in muscles. Um, is it the main source of ingestion by the human of, of, of this radioactivity, or is it just an example that you're providing? It's, it's, we would say, I would say that it's the main dangerous source. Uh, that, that there is a lot of ingestion of radioactivity naturally. But the problem is that there have never existed up until recently these, these radioactive particles. That they, they, they began after the, after the weapons fallout testing and the nuclear power and the splitting of the atom. So throughout evolution there have never been these particles in the environment. They don't, didn't exist. Um, the other question I'm <coughs> certainly <coughs> I know the answer. Um, it, are there any kind of tests made before food of this kind enters into the food chain? No. What they do is they test the overall radioactivity. This, this is the concern that we have had for a long time. Is that if you take a Geiger counter and you wave it over a surface, it will tell you what the dose rate is. So it will give you an average quantity of the radioactivity. What it won't do is tell you whether these little hot particles are present in the material. And, and that's quite a tricky thing to do. You, you can do it, but it's expensive and it, it, it's tedious, it takes a lot of time, and you can work out how many particles there are in any sample, but, uh, but uh, as in fact these people have done. But, it, but nobody does it routinely, no. Mm. The other, can I just finish? The, 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 just, um, the other um, area then that is of concern, which you actually said in your, in, in your presentation, is um, how far down the coast will it go? Because in Swansea, of course, there's a tradition of actually um, harvesting seaweed for lava bread, and also just further up the coast, of course, that you have the cockle industry of, um, you know, based in kind of Kaneshi and that area. Are we talking about those areas being affected? And if so, um, does that actually kill off? Uh, could potentially get <coughs> off an industry that we have. Those particles are already there. They're there as a result of Sellafield, they're there as a result of the operation of the various nuclear sites along the Bristol Channel. And the study that I did in, for the Irish government in 1997 to, to 2000 uh, examined the, the, the rates of cancer by distance from the sea in, 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 in Wales. So this, is, this is, it wasn't down in South Wales, so we, went, we did Mid and North Wales. And we found that there was a 30 to 40 percent excess risk of cancer along a coastal strip that was about one kilometre deep. And then it fell right out very rapidly. And that's also the same trend of distance of plutonium particles measured by Harwell, by the Atomic Energy Research Establishment in Harwell, who put up muslin screens. And they, and they intercepted the sea spray and the material coming from the sea, and they measured these. And they, this was all published in the, in the 80s, so it's, it's well known. It's called sea to land transfer. So the, the, the two routes of, of, um, of exposure to these particles are one where you eat the cockles or you eat the mussels or whatever, uh, because they filter the water, that's what they do. You know, so they're quite efficient at, at, at filtering these particles out and they end up inside them. So then when you eat them, they end up inside <coughs> you. And the other route is the airborne inhalation route, which is also well known. And that's why there is an excess risk near the sea, and that's why we found an excess risk in breast, uh, breast cancer in Burnham on sea dust downwind of about six, seven miles downwind of uh, Hinkley Point. And we did another study at Bradwell Nuclear Power Station in Essex, where there's a lot of mud. Found the same thing, a, a doubling of risk of breast cancer there. Breast cancer is a very good, <coughs> very good indicator for for these sorts of exposures. So the answer is we're already in that territory, and what we're saying <coughs> about this mud is that it's going to make it worse. So it, it's going to resuspend material that's kind of happily locked up <coughs> in the mud off Hinkley Point, and it's going to take it up and it's going to do this with it. And then the, the seven estuary has tremendously powerful tides and it just keeps everything in suspension all the time. So if you go across the bridge to England, you'll see that the water of the seven estuary is always brown. It's always brown. The reason is because the tides roar in and they roar out 
and they stir all the sediment up, and about 80% of the, of the material in it, uh, which would have been on the bottom of the, set, of the seven, is always in suspension. So whenever there's a gale of wind and there's those white caps and, and water starts to be splashed around, that stuff comes up into the air and it, it then gets blown ashore. And so all along that coast, I mean, I haven't done, a, I've done some cancer studies of that South Wales coast and the, and the increased rates of lung cancer are highest, the rates are highest along, along the coast along that bit. Um, right the way up into the southern Uh I'll end up having from BBC Wales. This is a question I never thought I'd ask in any uh, macro press conference. But do you eat missiles? No. No, I, to, I, I, I said it once though, when I was in Carlisle. For this very reason? Uh, yes, yes. Um, but I was in Carlingford in Ireland in 1998 talking about this very issue because the Irish Sea is very contaminated and that stuff goes across to Ireland. In, 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 Carlingford lot, they, they have oysters. And so I, I, I was talking to the Irish government about this, there was a big meeting, and afterwards some guy came up to me and said, if you eat those oysters, I was, I was with, with some friends there, I was with the mayor of Doherty, we were, we were at a restaurant, and he said, if your man eats so many oysters here, he's dead. <laughs> so, so it is, and also that, that lost a lot of money. I remember we, 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 I did an interview on the Irish radio and they said that it wiped a huge load of money off the Irish fishing industry. But look, it's not my fault. All I'm doing is I'm saying that this is the evidence and it shows that, that these things are dangerous because of these particles. The particles are not measured. Nobody measures the particles. They just measure average radiation. And something should be done about that because people are dying. Uh, oh, I've heard from my team in Wales. Uh, so, and under Blue say the risk here is quite low. So, for you guys, how high is the risk if this mud or this silt gets um, drenched? I think, I think it's a question as well. The, the, the kind of testing done. So, so, what is the risk of other mud arriving? from ITV Wales. Uh, uh, but I, I thought you'd touch on... But as I said to you testing. earlier on, you can't tell because we don't have the baseline data. We don't know what is the dose currently received by people in South Wales. Well, I, I, that's the, that's that's the important I, I, thing. I, I, and then you can add on the CFAS calculations, which are only modelled. They're not empirical. <coughs> they're only hypothetical. You can add them on on top of the dose that local people are receiving in South Wales. Now what we're being told at the moment is that the only dose that they have to worry about is the dose from the mud. And they've got their calculations of it by their basis having monitored only three of the 50 plus radionuclides which are man-made coming out of Hinkley into those sediments. They say the dose is very low. But they don't know what they're going to add that on to here. So we've got no idea, that's my point about that particular issue, we've got no idea of what the health risk is, because the health risk is, what have you already got, plus what is the proposal going to add to you? We don't know. We have no data on that. So you can't officially calculate the health risk. That's, yeah, that, that, that's the main issue for me, because... There, there have only been five, <coughs> five samples below five centimetres. That was back in 2009. And the data does not, the data no longer exists. It's not there. They so throw it away. Retest, you know, I think that's a very reasonable thing to say. Retest, and I mean, you know, well, that, that's the message which I want to send out. What well, I can say is that I've received 28 spectra. 20, I, I received the, the raw data we asked for, he asked for, and I got the raw spectral data that CFAS produced in 2013 and 2017 from the surface. And what that shows is the presence of these alpha emitting substances. It can't tell us whether they're in the form of particles, but they almost certainly are. But it certainly shows that they are there, and you will not get anything like that in a banana or in your garden. Okay, Martin, we do words? Yes, I mean, just to explore the testing a little further, if they did agree to do the tests, uh, obviously, one would look at the results. Is there any circumstance in which the results that came back would lead you to change your mind about the dangers? If they, were, if they, if they did particle testing and there were no particles there, I would change my mind about the dangers. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. I think that's a really <coughs> good question to end on because you know what we're saying is if, if they test them, then the particles, then the, the objections will cease. But they're not testing. 
and we need to make sure that they do. So thanks a lot for coming today. Yeah, so just pitch one last word. Uh, I, it always strikes me. This, this whole business that we've been through over these last six months, if this has been a shipload of radioactive material aggregating nine billion becquerels and it has sunk in the Cardiff grounds, there would have been a hell of a fuss to pay. There would be chaos, there would be impacts on the market, on, on regional produce. Welsh Government would have had to get very, very active in taking, attempting to take mitigating um, processes to reduce the potential impact. And, and that's what would have happened. And just because it's EDF dredging it and bringing it over slowly, bit by bit, and dumping it, doesn't actually mean to say that we can ignore it and pretend that it's not an issue. Thank you. Okay, come on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. So if you want one, then it's a briefing about the three servers. Okay. <coughs> um, one, one, one here, if you want. Because there are major differences between the three servers, and we don't think that it's accurate to have such wild and different methods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. So, okay. Hang on. Okay. Okay. Hopefully, it's in countries.